all right, I'm going to need a couple men to go next door and get some chairs and get put out. <laughs> we had 100 decisions this week, amen? 100 decided not to be here on Friday night. Uh, hey, let me tell you this. We, we've, got, we've got kids playing ball. We've got homecoming. We've got three high schools of football games. We've got cheerleaders. We've got families, and those people need to be where they need to be. We understand that tonight. They made commitments, and this is off grid and off the schedule. But I'll tell you what, God knows who's going to be here. He knows what we need, uh, and I'm going to tell you, I'm glad Big Papa's in the house tonight. Amen? Amen. We're glad to have Brother Bill. You, you tell me how blessed you are to have two guys like Brother Casey and Brother Bill be able to come on, on an unplanned, unscheduled thing. You have to book these guys a year or two out in advance, and then all of a sudden we just fell into this deal. So I'm just saying God's been good to us. God's opened doors for us, and, and uh, we're praying for tonight to be the best night of the meeting. Amen. Amen. So. I'm excited. The Allen family has been such a blessing to us tonight. We're so honored to have them with us. Uh, many have asked about their ministry. You know, they shared some of the things about what's going on in Uganda tonight. I want to tell you something that I learned about when we were all in Ala together. They've had 25 years together on the road uh, doing what they're doing in their ministry. Of course, COVID hit everybody. Brother Bill knows that. We, we had cancellations and things, and, and, and it kind of changed the way people were able to operate in ministry, and, and they had an incentive for their 25-year anniversary. They had people that started giving $25 a month uh, to be a blessing to them. They called them the A-Team. That's what they, we called our softball team the A-Team back when Antioch was dominating the diamond. Amen. But uh, if you got any questions about maybe being a part of that, you'd like to join in and, and support that ministry, catch them at the table tonight uh, and do that. And, of course, I, I look forward to a partnership in the future uh, between the Allens and our church. Uh, and we're very thankful for how the Lord used them here this week. And I told them today, I said, our folks have just fallen in love with you guys, and we're honored to have you. So if you uh, if you want to be on the A team, now we're the AA team. Well, that's probably not right, AA. Never mind. <laughs> talk to them if you want to talk about the A team tonight. And if you need AA, see me after the service, and uh, we'll help you with that too. Hey, we might be few in number tonight. But we're going to give the Lord move, uh, room to move tonight. I'm just telling you tonight, God's not through with this. And, uh, and we're praying and we're believing God tonight for whatever he wants to do. Uh, and so we're following him tonight. So I'm excited. I know that all of us are probably at a place where you're a little tired, you're a little weary. Uh, but you're here tonight because you're ready. And I am too. Uh, and I'm ready to see what God's going to do for us tonight. So I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. Uh, and we're going to give this thing over to the Lord. The Allens are going to come and they're going to do that for us. I've said last night how honored I've been. I, I've never seen a meeting for our church that I've had more interaction. People texting, calling, sending messages, people posting things on social media about what's going on at Revival, inviting people. That has been incredible. Yeah. Another thing that has just overwhelmed me has been the ministerial support that we have had from preachers and pastors and people who have texted. I'm talking about, of course, we had a great group Monday night. But we had preachers Wednesday night that let their associate preach so they could be here. That came to get in on the meeting, and we've had just great support from our preacher brethren. I got a text today from a preacher that couldn't be here tonight. He was here Monday night. He was on a, a, a something for his church today. He had to pass through Farmville. He sent me a picture of the church. He's sitting out here in the parking lot praying for revival. Now, that, that shouldn't be unusual, but it is. But it's a blessing. Man, that just blessed my heart. Man, I'm telling you, God's just, God's just shown us favor this week. And we're praying tonight God put a big old exclamation point right here on this meeting. And I want to go ahead and tell you this. We're not going to have service tomorrow night. But we're going to pick it up Sunday morning with Brother Reuben Weaver and the ABC3. Amen? Amen. And I'm telling you what, Big Daddy's coming in hot. I done listened to all these preachers mess up everything they tried to pro I got to fix a lot of stuff come Sunday. Now, hey. Buddy, I, I, I thought about building an outline around all the messages we've heard and just, just preaching that. It's going to be on. I, I'm excited about Sunday. So you be here for that. Rest up tomorrow. You come ready for church Sunday. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you tonight for all the many blessings you've bestowed on us this week. You've just been God, and, and that can't help but be good. So I pray tonight, Lord, that you just be you. Just show up in this place and do what you do. Don't let us get discouraged tonight. Don't let us, Lord, get, get tired or weary. Don't let this thing fizzle. I, I pray, Lord, tonight be the strongest night that we've met. I, I pray you'll take what you've built on and, and that you'll just continue. Lord, as we started Sunday morning, uh, we, we start here tonight. Do it again. Uh, and so we pray tonight for our brother as he comes to preach the word to us. What an honor tonight to have Brother Bill Britt with us. And we pray, uh, Lord, you bless him and use him. I rejoice with him over what's done this week in his ministry, Lord, for where he's going next week. And, Lord, I pray that this be not just a way for you to use him to bless us, but use us to bless him tonight. Uh, and let's all leave here revived. 
Thank you for the Allens, what they mean to our church, Lord, what they've done for this meeting. Bless them tonight as they come and do what they do. And I pray tonight, Lord, Holy Spirit, just be full in this place. Lord, uh, just, just take what you came to take, do what you came to do. And, Lord, we pray your will be done. Jesus, be magnified. Let souls be saved, lives changed. And we'll thank you and praise you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Y'all welcome the Allens tonight. Amen. <laughs> on our worship anytime the praise is real the spirit of us of a linter and suddenly the house is filled oh, all the way up to the ceiling all the way down to the floor it's a whole lot more than a feeling when you're in the presence of the lord there's a whole lot of heaven in the house For the Holy Spirit, they knew he'd be coming soon. Oh, finally the place was shaken. No one in the room sat still. When the count was finally taken, everybody in the house was still. There's a whole lot of heaven in the house. A whole lot of heaven in the house. A little bit of praise goes a long, long way. There's a whole lot of heaven in the house. you stand to your feet we'll sing this next song you learned it on Sunday and so you should know it by now amen
riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood near the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. should be a little more familiar to you. No, not one. I love this song. And we're going to sing all five verses because all five verses are good.
people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. sing this together. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a privilege to carry. This song was requested to be sung again. Um, for the life of me, I don't know why, because uh, there's really nothing special about the way I sing it, and it's just done with the piano. But I'm going to do it. And uh, but right before I do it, I just want to let everyone know how much of a blessing each and every one of you have been to me, have been to 
my family. It's not often that we pull up to a church and they'll love us as much as you guys have and express that in all the ways that you have, so thank you. But I'd like to leave you with a little bit of a challenge today. I was thinking about it on the car right over here. That is to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And wouldn't it be amazing if what has happened here in just the course of the last five days when we come back, who knows when, but maybe in a year from now, we see it going just as strong as it is right now. That would be my prayer for you, and I know that's a possibility, but it's not a guarantee. So always staying in the faith, in the word, in prayer. These seem like simple things of Christianity that we would teach little kids, but it's so fun how, well, it's not fun, but it's funny how we completely disregard these things because life gets in the way. And I'll just give you a little personal testimony. Two days ago, I realized that was me. Life was getting in the way, just things that I wanted, things that I wish would have happened that just weren't happening for me, and I was busying my day with everything I could to try and get myself to a place I wanted to get to. But it's so easy to forget about God in those times. I don't even know why I'm sharing this with you. This I wouldn't plan on doing this. This isn't even part of the song, but it is too easy today to forget about God in all of the times in our life. But in the vast scheme of things, all the things that you want, the job opportunities, the relationships, it means nothing. It means nothing. It's just, it's just a little blip on what is the time of this entire world that will continue to go on when, before you were born and after. So if we would just ground ourselves in God, if we would just trust in Him, clean out the places of our life that hold sin in them. Maybe then we would see an incredible revival. My heart is like a house One day I let the Savior in There were many said, Jesus, well, I'm just not ready for you and me to visit in that room. See, that's a place in my
Debbie, I, you know, I've done this for about a year now, and I've asked so many people this question. But is there a place in your heart where even you don't?
everybody give the Lord a hand for the freedom that he gave to you tonight. Brother Bill, God bless you, friend. Looking forward to hearing Big Papa tonight. Praise God. Amen. See if the green light's on. It's on. Well, turn to your neighbor and say, you look good for a Friday night. All right, would you do that? Been good? <laughs> Boy, I tell you, I appreciate the Allen family. We've worked together in uh, several different places for a long time, and it's always a joy to be around them and be with them, and, and uh, good to see them tonight. And uh, Brother Reuben said that uh, y'all were going to extend, ask if I could come over, and I'm just glad to be in the mix. Amen. And, I know all the preachers that you've had, and uh, except maybe for one, and I know you've heard a word. Come on, amen. And uh, on a Sunday morning, you heard a, a reviving message from Brother Mike about revival. On Sunday night, you uh, heard a pointed message about the preeminence of Christ. On Monday night, you heard a great message on grace. On Tuesday night, you heard a, a wonderful message on wisdom. Does anybody in the house know what understand? <laughs> on Wednesday night, you heard a message, a powerful message on the preciousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last night was a fabulous message on faith. So I hope you get something tonight. Come on, amen. Take your Bible, if you will, and turn to the book. Uh, 1 Samuel, okay, I've really been struggling as to what to preach as there's so much on my heart tonight, but I want you to turn to 1 Samuel, I want you to find chapter 6, and this is a very unusual passage of scripture, matter of fact, you probably hadn't, uh, you know, taken a lot of notes on this through the years because it's kind of a, uh, an abstract kind of a passage of scripture that we don't study a whole lot, but I pray that, uh, it, and I believe it's right in the flow of what God's doing in these days. Come on, amen. And uh, it's always good to be here at Antioch with Brother Reuben and his sweet family. Thank God for him. Brother Reuben serves on our board for Compel, and we're grateful for him and for this church's support of what we're doing around the world. And uh, we're grateful for what God did this week. Come on, amen. And, and I believe it's going to continue in the days ahead. You know, I try to tell pastors when we do these revivals that uh, you know, revival meetings just don't last the, the days that we're together, but they have residual effects. And there'll be things happen out of this meeting for months to come. Come on, amen. amen. And um, so I'm just grateful for what he's been doing. First Samuel chapter 6. Let's stand together as we read the Word of God, starting in verse 7. If you're ready to hear the Word, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Now, therefore, make a new cart and take two milk kine. And that's just cows, milk cows, on which there's come no yoke, and tie the cows to the cart and bring their calves home from them. And take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart and put the jewels of gold which you return him for a trespass offering and a coffer by the side thereof and send it away that it may go. And see if it goeth up by the way of his own coast to Beth Shemesh. Then he has done us this great evil, but if not, then... We shall know what is not his, it was not his hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. Let me just stop and say something to you. I get a little weary of hearing Christians talking about good luck and bad luck. There's no such thing as luck in the believer's life. We operate under the providence of a holy God. I've heard people say, you know, I got in this car wrecked. I, I rolled my car 14 times, knocked down 17 pine trees took out 150 yards of barbed wire fence, climbed out without a scratch. Boy, wasn't I lucky? No, God protected you. Well, I didn't have a job, lost my job, walked into this place to hire me on the spot, making more money now than I did at my last job. Oh, I was lucky to be on that job site. No, the providence of God led you to that site. I just, I won't, I, we won't take up another offering. I'll just let you know that, Amen. Look at verse 10, and the men did so and took the two milk cows and tied them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart and the coffer of the mice of gold and the images of the emeralds. Listen, I promise you, in just a few minutes, all this will make sense, all right? 
And the cows took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them unto the border of Beth Shemesh, and they of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. The cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemite and stood there, where there was a great stone, and they clave the wood of the cart and offered the kind of the cows a burnt offering unto the Lord. You may be seated. I want to speak to you for a few moments tonight on milk cow faith. Can I hear an amen? There's some things in the, in the lives of these old milk cows, Brother Allen, that everybody in this room needs to take home with them tonight. Now, I want to go back and just kind of give you the back story and catch up on where we read from. I don't have time to read all these chapters, so let me just tell you the story right quick. Turn to your neighbor and say, wake up and listen. It's a good story. The people of God were in a battle with the Philistine army. And they were being defeated, and they didn't know what to do. And uh, so the people of God got together and thought, man, if, if something doesn't happen, uh, these Philistines are going to defeat us. And, and so somebody had the wise idea, well, we'll go into the uh, city of Shiloh, which uh, was not the capital city at that time. It was pretty much their headquarters, and we'll bring out the Ark of the Covenant on the battlefield. Now, you've got to understand that the Ark of the Covenant uh, represented the person and the power and the provision of Almighty God. And they thought if we could just get the Ark of the Covenant out on the battlefield, then God will give us the victory. Well, for one thing, God told them not to do that, but they used it like a lucky charm. I've known people that say, boy, when a tornado is coming toward your house, put your Bible on the coffee table in the direction in which, it, which it's coming, and the tornado will go around your house. That's nonsense. Oh, I, I've seen a lot of Bibles on the back dash of a car, you know, because they think just having a copy of the Bible in their car will bring them good luck. Listen, that's nothing more than witchcraft. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying tonight? Well, the people of God brought the Ark of the Covenant out on the battlefield, and when the Philistine army saw it, uh, or, or when the people of God saw it, rather, they began to shout. Matter of fact, the Word of God says they shouted so loud that it kind of it created an earthquake, and the, and the earth under, their, under the Philistines' feet began to tremble, and, and, and they thought, man, either God's given them some weapon of warfare that we don't know about, or God's promised them victory, and, and they got scared, and, and so the next day they went out to battle, and the Philistine army defeated the people of God. And I want to give you a spiritual principle here tonight. Turn to your neighbor and say, listen up. You never win the spiritual battles of life by shouting and getting emotional. You win the spiritual battles of life by obeying the Word of God. Now, I'm not against shouting, and Baptists need to shout more. Amen. And we need to get happy, but I'm telling you, you can get goosebumps on your back when somebody gets the high note on the, on the special music and think the Holy Ghost is been visiting with you. Hold on a second. Don't take that out of my love offering. Amen. You can get goosebumps down your spine when somebody hits the high note on the special music and you'll think the Holy Ghost is visiting. No, ladies and gentlemen, it's not where God works the deepest part of our life. God never does his deepest work in the most shallow place of your life, and that's your emotion. Is anybody listening to me? Well, the people of God were defeated. Three things happened. Well, they got beat, number one. Number two, Eli's, the high priest's sons, both of them were killed. And the Ark of the Covenant was stolen by the enemy. Well, some runners ran back to tell Eli what happened. He was a big old fat guy like me. And they said, uh, Eli, we hate to tell you, but the people of God have been defeated. And second of all, both your boys have died in, in the battle. But third of all, Eli, I hate to tell you this, but the Ark of the Covenant has been stolen away. And his soul brought distraught and heartache to Eli. He fell over backwards and he died. And I want to tell you something. There was a little baby about to be born at that time. And you know what they named him? Ichabod. The glory of God has departed. I was in a revival one time, Brother Reuben, and this lady came up to me and she said, Brother Bill, I'm afraid if we don't have revival this week, God's going to write Michelob over the face of this church. And I thought, my soul, he might have already had, honey. Amen. 
Now watch this. Are y'all still with me? If you are, say amen. Now the Philistines have the Ark of the Covenant. They don't know what to do with it. Reminds me of some churches I've been in when the Spirit of God gets to moving and folks don't know what to do. And so they get rid of the preacher. Come on, somebody help me right now. Well, they put it in the temple of Dagon, their old false god. Now, I don't know if he was made out of wood, stone, whatever, but they put him in the temple, they put the Ark of the Covenant in the temple of Dagon, and when they got up the next morning to check on the Ark of the Covenant, this old statue, this wooden or stone, it had fallen down in front of the Ark of the Covenant. So they propped him up. <laughs> That's what you've got to do with your God if it's not Jesus. Come on, Amen. I've never had to prop Jesus up, but he sure has lifted me up many times. Well, they got old Dagon back up on his feet, and I don't know if I'm blessing anybody, but I'm getting blessed, amen. And, and uh, so they lifted old Dagon up again, and this time they went in there the next morning, and Dagon had fallen in front of the Ark of the Covenant again, but this time his head and his hands had broken off. It's an Old Testament picture of a New Testament scripture. Every knee shall bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I've got news for the Republicans and the Democrats and the Independents. I've got news for the Russians and the Chinese and everybody in between. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Well, they started getting sick. They started falling out, man. They had these tumors and they started dying. And they said, we got to get rid of this thing. So here's what they did. If y'all still with me, say, I'm with you. Turn to your neighbor and say, we're going somewhere. All right, we're going somewhere. So they built a, arc, or they built a cart that had never been pulled before. So it wouldn't go to the left, it wouldn't go to the right. And then they hooked up two mama cows. They never used cows to pull these arcs. It was oxen, but they hooked up two mama cows to pull this cart, and they put the Ark of the Covenant on the cart, and they said, hey, if these mama cows take the straight way to Bashemish, then we'll know Jehovah God put this disease on us. But if it goes the crooked way and comes back, we'll know it was just bad luck. So they put the Ark of the Covenant on, uh, on the cart, and these mama cows take off. And that's my introduction. Now we're going to preach a little while. Y'all with me? There are several things I want you to see in the Scripture tonight that apply to you and me tonight. First of all, these cows had a new experience of grace. Now watch this. These cows didn't have enough sense to get hooked up to the Ark of the Covenant and the cart. Somebody had to do it for them. Hey, let me tell you something. The Bible says that we're dead in our sins and trespasses. The Bible says no man seeks after God. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, we were on the bottom of the ocean floor. The salt water of sin had already gotten in our lungs. There was no hope for us. But I'm glad over 2,000 years ago, God built, uh, veiled his deity in human flesh, and he dived down to the bottom floor of that ocean. And ladies and gentlemen, he snatched me up by the back of the neck. He pumped the salt water out of my lungs, and he filled me with life. Come on, amen. Save me. I didn't have enough sense to come to God. Matter of fact, the night I got saved, I was on the back row minding my own business. Had a Holy Ghost interruption. <laughs> hey, most of y'all, when you came to church on that Sunday or that revival meeting, or you was driving down the road on that Tuesday morning going to work, you had no, listen, you had no idea that was the day you were going to get saved. But I'm telling you, the Spirit of God arrested you. And aren't you glad for the Holy Ghost of God that will come and interrupt our lives and reveal to us that we're sinners on our way to a devil's hell? And Jesus will save us and wash us in his blood. Come on, amen. Everybody needs an experience of grace. Come on, amen. Has there been a time in your life that you realized you were a filthy, rotten, hell-deserving sinner? And listen, you repented toward God by faith, gave your life to Jesus Christ, and he made all things new. Is that your testimony tonight? Well, then that's just the start. I said, that's just the start. Now, the Bible says, watch this. The Bible says they hooked up these mama cows, and, and let, let's read this again. And the Bible says in verse 9, And see if it goes up by its own coast to Bethshemesh, then he has done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know it was not his hand that smote us, 
But it was just a chance, bad luck. And so the men did so, took the two milk cows and tied them up to the car and shut up their calves at home. <laughs> These cows start off. Now notice what the Bible says. They shut up their calves at home. And verse 12 says, they went, a, they went along the highway lowing as they went, and they turned not aside to the right hand or the left. Now, I'm not a, I'm not a cattle farmer. I, I, I didn't grow up on a farm, but I know enough about cows. You shut up a mama cow from their calf, and they'll tear the barn down to get to that calf. It's not natural for a mama cow to go off and leave her calf. No more than it's natural for a mama to go off and leave a baby. Can I hear an amen tonight? But here these cows are, they're going down this path, and they're lowing as they went down this straight and narrow path, crying out. Listen, I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, you know why they left their cow, baby calves? You know why they went down that straight and narrow way? Because you see, when you, <laughs> when you get a new experience of grace, you get a new nature. Come on, amen. And 2 Peter 1, 4 says we are partakers of the divine nature of God. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, when you get saved, the Spirit of God invades your life. You're baptized into the body of Christ by the Spirit. I'm telling you, you're, you're on, on, the old things have passed away, but all things have become new. Amen. Well, you know, Grandma was redheaded and had a temper, and Mama was redheaded and had a temper, and that's just my personality. I'm redheaded and got a temper. Not if the Holy Ghost is in charge of your life. You know, Grandpa was a cusser, and Daddy was a cusser, and I'm just born to be a cusser. No, not if the Holy Ghost. Is anybody listening to me? You, you listen. You have a new nature tonight. That's why. Listen. One way I knew I got saved is I started having a desire to read the Word and pray and go to church and spend time with God. My old nature doesn't like that kind of stuff. Uh, it's, it's kind of always amazes me. People say, uh, uh, Bill, how do you know if it's God speaking to you, not the devil? Well, if God told you to forgive some, or, or, or if you felt like forgiving somebody, that wasn't the devil, that was God. Yeah. If you get up in the morning hungry for the word, that's not the devil, that's God. Yeah. Come on, amen. amen. If you have a hunger to pray, that's not the devil, that's God. Yeah, because you have a brand new nature. Yeah. Old yeah. things have passed away. Amen. Is anybody getting anything out of what I'm saying? Yeah. See, when you get a new experience of grace, you get a new nature. But then notice what else the Bible says in verse 12. They went down this highway lowing as they went. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen this or not, but I've been on some farms, and I've seen the old mama cow put her head through the barbed wire fence. No! Can I tell you what she's saying? I want my baby. Now, here's the thing. When you get a new experience of grace, you get a new nature, and that gives you a new talk. Here's the amazing thing. These mama cows never went back to where their babies were, but they cried out for their babies to be where they are. You see, when you get born again to the Spirit of God, you don't want to go back to the club. You don't want to go back to that, that, that uh, beer party. You don't want to go back and live in all that garbage. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, but you do want your buddies down at the club to come back where you are and experience the grace of God. That's the reason I don't believe there's very many saved people in church because there's nobody really burdened for the lost. And, and Jesus told the Pharisees one day, he said, if you're not worried about going to heaven, uh, then, uh, if you're not concerned about others going to heaven, then I doubt you're going to heaven yourself. Billy Graham said only one out of a hundred people ever went a soul to Christ. I cannot imagine me going my whole life and never opening my mouth up enough to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. One of the ways I knew I got saved, I couldn't wait to get to my school the next day and tell all my friends about what Jesus had done for me. Does anybody listen to me? It's as natural for a Christian to share the gospel as it is for a bird to fly. <laughs> listen, I want to tell you something. When I got saved, I witnessed everything that moved. If it didn't move, I pray God would wake it up and... So I can witness to it. Come on, amen. I try to be a consistent witness. When I, when I fill up with gas, I got these little tracks. They're little folded tracks. And, when, and, and listen, they fit right in the credit card holder at the gas pump. I leave them all. Come on, amen. Let me, can, I, can I just take a time out and tell, give a little testimony? I just did a Bible conference down in uh, Zachary, Louisiana, that Labor Day weekend. 
And uh, the church just got a new youth pastor. And man, he has a pretty rough past. And God saved him. That dude's on fire for God. His wife got saved. And they're serving there. Well, his dad came over from Mississippi uh, to be in the Bible conference with his son. And he's so fired up because his son, who was in drugs and dealing drugs, now is saved. And his daughter-in-law is saved. And he wanted to be over there with the Bible conference. Well, he has some other kids that are still out in the world. And one of his daughters was in Baton Rouge somewhere. And his son said, Dad, I'm going to go find my sister. And I'm going to bring her to this conference. He said, Son, we have no idea where she is. And here's what he said. God's going to show me. You just, about got to, you just about have to get some Assembly of God friends to pray for you for stuff like that because Baptists don't believe it. That's good preaching right there, son. Amen. The first place he went, his sister was sitting on a curb. Brought her and her boyfriend to the conference I preached Sunday morning, and both of them got saved. That boy hadn't been saved too long. Man, I'm telling you, he was in drugs. But he got, you know what? Now he's got a new, he wants everybody to be saved. Well, old Denver, the daddy, you know, was, that was right after uh, the hurricane, and so gas was short down there, and, so the conference was over on Monday noon, so he got up 5.30 Monday morning to go down to the gas station so he wouldn't have to wait in the line to fill up his pickup with gas so he could get back to Mississippi. And he's over there praising God. His son and daughter-in-law are saved. Now his daughter and her boyfriend, now they're going to get married. They're saved. And he's on cloud nine. He's putting gas in his pickup. One of the linemen from another state was down there working, uh, trying to get power on down there in South Louisiana. And he looked over at Denver and he said, man, you look like you've got a lot of joy. He said, oh, sir, you don't even know the half of it. He said, it's because of Jesus. He said, do you know Jesus? He said, well, I know about him. He said, well, do you know today if you died, you'd go to heaven or hell? He said, I don't know about that. He said, can I pray with you? He said, wait just a minute. He went and got his crew, came over there. Denver led everyone on to Jesus around the gas pump. If I wasn't so fat, I'd turn a flip right now. Come on, somebody. When you get a new experience of grace, you get a new nature. And now you got a new talk. Watch this. Y'all still with me? If you're still with me, say, I'm with you. That's what it says in verse 12 again. They went along the highway, lowing as they went, turned not aside to the right hand nor the left. You get a new walk. I don't know if you've ever read Pilgrim's Progress. If you haven't, you need to read that. Christian is on his way to that celestial city. He's on, uh, making his pilgrimage. And he comes to a part, in, a place in the road where there's lines to his left and there's lines to his right. And if he gets too far this way or too far that way, the lines will devour him. I want to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. The place where you and I ought to be as the saints of God is in a street called Straight. Come on, amen. And it's interesting to me that when the apostle Paul was saved from Saul to Paul in the book of Acts chapter 9, he began his ministry on a street called Straight. Come on, amen. Now, y'all going to love me when I get through with this? You know, you preach on holiness these days, and they'll call you a legalist. I never thought I'd live to see the day where I'd preach against drinking alcohol in a Baptist church and have people get up all in my face about it. Listen, I'm telling you, we have gotten so far from the street called straight even in the church. You know, the preacher can get up and preach about homosexuality and abortion and everybody will shout him down. Well, why don't we deal with what's in the house tonight? Gossip and jealousy and envy and slander. Come on, amen. Prayerlessness, laziness. Listen, when you get saved, now you have a desire to be on the street called straight. Come on, amen. If you can be just as happy holding a Budweiser in your hand as you hold a Bible, you've never been saved, honey. If you're just as comfortable in a bar as you are in the church house, you've never been saved. Come on. Is anybody listening to me tonight? One thing, one reason I know I'm saved, God won't let me get away with nothing. I pour my milk and my alphabet cereal and it spells repent right there in the bowl. <laughs> the 
a new walk. Is anybody listening to me? Let me give you three quick reasons why you ought to stay in the straight and narrow way. Number one, people are watching you. I don't care how little your circle of influence may be to you, somebody's watching you. Maybe, da- uh, maybe a boy, maybe a little girl. Maybe a- Is anybody here with me tonight? I was preaching a meeting, and a guy got saved. Nobody knew who he was. The preacher didn't know who he was. And so after the service, the pastor said, how did you come to be here today, you know, and you gave your life to Christ? He said, well, my wife's been visiting a little bit, and, and uh, my wife got up this morning, and I got up, we got our little boy up, and, and uh, my, my wife said, uh, uh, now I'm going to take uh, our son to Bible school, uh, or to Sunday school in church, and, and uh, we're going to stay for the preaching service. And, and he said, no, he said, I'm taking him to eat breakfast, and we're going to come home and watch NASCAR. And uh, he said, my wife said, no, I, I'm taking him to Sunday school in church, and We're going to stay for the preaching and all that. He said, no, I'm telling you, I'm going to take him to breakfast, and then we're going to come back and watch NASCAR. And they got this, he said, we got this big old fight. And he said, my little boy just kind of wedged his way in between us and looked up uh, and looked up uh, at, at, at at his mama and said, yeah, mama, why can't I stay home and go to hell with daddy? Are you, listen, people are watching you tonight. I just wrote an article. It was in the Baptist Message, our state paper, and it was out of Acts 16. When Paul and Silas were in prison, the Bible says that Paul and Silas at the midnight hour began to praise God and pray and sing praises to the Lord, and the prisoners were listening to them. The prisoners were listening to them. Hey, people listen to how you talk, your negative spirit or your positive spirit. They, they hear you talking in a God. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? Second reason you ought to stay in the straight and narrow way. Not only are people watching you, but every step you take can never be taken again. This lady gossiped about her, about her pastor, just kind of tried to ruin him. She got under conviction about it, went to his office and asked for forgiveness. And he said, yes, ma'am, I forgive you, no problem. Said, I forgive you. you. Forget it ever happened. But I want you to do one thing. He, she said, I'll do anything, Pastor. I want you to take a feather pillow, and I want you to go out by the interstate, and I want you to take a knife and cut open that feather pillow, and I want you to empty out those feathers all in the median of the interstate, and then two weeks from now, I want you to go back and get all those feathers and put them back in the pillow. She said, that's impossible. He said, also, it's impossible to take back all the garbage you said. Is anybody in here for the back row or the front row? Is anybody in here besides me? As soon as something come out, you wish you could grab it and put it back in your mouth? Well, it's getting quiet. Now I might need to camp out on this. It's getting quiet. Have you ever done something and said, wouldn't to God, I'd have never done that? There's another reason you ought to stay in the straight and narrow way. Every step you take as a child of God is awaiting the judgment seat of Christ. Now, we're not going to be judged according to our sin at the judgment seat. We'll be judged according to our works as what we've done in this body since we've been saved. But I believe with all my heart, one of the reasons God's going to have to wipe away tears is because of the loss or reward at the judgment seat of Christ. I don't believe there ain't be anybody when we get to heaven and say, boy, I tell you what, I just, I stayed up at that church too much. Man, I, I, I should have watched more football, man. I, I read the Bible too much. Man, I, I, I tell you what, I, I just spent too much time praying when I was on earth. Man, I just spent too much time burdened for the, no, we're going to say, wouldn't to God? Is anybody getting anything out of what I'm saying? <laughs> now watch this, y'all still with me? If you are, say Amen. We're about to finish. Turn to your neighbor say he's about to finish. And that's not just preacher talk. I'm telling you we're about to finish. This is so good right here. Turn to your neighbor and say this is so good right here. You didn't know you could learn so much from a milk cow, did you? <laughs> now watch this. Verse 13, and they of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced. Boy, isn't it sweet when the presence, the manifested presence of God comes into place? 
Isn't it good? To, I, listen, I've been driving down the road in my pickup truck and had some of the best worship experiences I've ever had in my life when the glory of God, I, I, had, I had about to have me a spell coming over here, amen. I was listening to somebody sing about the blood of Jesus and I heard another song about Jesus, we love you. And I'm telling you, man, if it hadn't been raining, I'd have had my window down and I'd have had my arm out the door. Come on, amen, hallelujah. Yeah. Is anybody here tonight? Amen. Now watch this. This <laughs> I'm getting excited because I know what I'm going to say, all right? Look at verse 14. And the cart came into the field of Joshua. You know what the name Joshua means? Savior just like Jesus. The cart came into the field of Joshua, Savior, of Shemite, and stood there where there was a great stone. And they claimed the word of the cart and offered the cows a burnt offering to the Lord. Now watch this. We're going to sum all this up. You've heard some great preaching from these other men of God all week long. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Now, what we got to do, we got to start living out what we heard. You see, we've heard more truth this week than we could live out a lifetime, but we need to get busy doing it. Come on, amen. Now, here, here's, the, here's the deal, and this kind of brings all this, this whole week together right here. When you have a new experience of grace, you get a new nature, right or wrong. Then you get a new talk. Can somebody pass the third row? Say amen. Then you get a new walk. But then you get a new service. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's about to help you if you'll let him. Oh, he's about to help you if you'll let him. Now these old cows went on the straight and narrow way up to Beth Shemesh, and they come to this field, the field of Joshua, and there's a stone, and it's a great stone. Let me tell you who we serve tonight. We serve Jesus. Now your pastor serves this church. This pastor serves this community. But you know what? Not ultimately, he serves Jesus. Is anybody listening to me? When you get up here and sing, when you teach a class, when you go out and knock on a door, when you take a, a meal to somebody that's hurting, when you go to share the God, listen, we're, we're, not, we're, not, uh, we're not ultimately serving the church. We're serving Jesus. That's why you don't get, need to get discouraged about carnal and, uh, and backslidden church members and lost church members and hypocrites in the church because your service is not to them. Your service is to Jesus. I pastor the meanest woman in America. I'd get my hair cut short. She'd call me a skinhead. I'd let it grow out. She'd call me a hippie. I'd preach 20 minutes. She'd say, well, you didn't study this week, did you? I'd preach an hour. She'd say, you're too long-winded. Every Sunday morning, I want to say, Louise, would you stand up and lead us in a word of criticism? Come on, amen. <laughs> I've had some of the meanest things said to me, not by the world, by, law, by, by, by church members. But my service is to him. See, some of you are discouraged tonight, and maybe it's not working out. Maybe, maybe you're about ready to throw in the time. Hey, let me tell you something. Those mean-spirited people that have come after you and try to discourage you and hurt you, hey, listen, just look up. We're serving him tonight. We're serving him. But watch this. Y'all still with me? Lest you think I discount the local church. They came into a field of Joshua where there was a great stone. You remember Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, Who do men say that I am? And, and uh they say, well, some people say you're John the Baptist or you're Jeremiah or Isaiah or one of the prophets. And, and then Peter spoke up and he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but upon this rock I will build my church. Now, he wasn't saying that Peter was the first pope of the church. He wasn't saying we're going to build the church on you, Peter. He said that, that word Peter means little stone. I, I'm going to take people like you, Simon Peter, that confess me as Lord, and I'm going to put them on me, the rock of Gibraltar, and I'm going to build my church. We serve Jesus, the person, through the place called the local church. Now, people don't like this these days. Now, I know some folks don't need to be in church. I understand that. I'm not discounting COVID. I've had family members diving. We've had a lot of people in our church diving. I'm not making light of COVID, so don't misunderstand me. But I'm saying, if you can go to the ball field, if you can go to Sam's, if you can go to Walmart, if you can go out on the, on the you can come to God's house. 
You say, well, you know, Brother Bill, I, I can just sit on my couch and go to pajama church. That's what one couple told me. I can go to pajama and sit my coffee and watch the service. Let me tell you the difference between coming to church and sitting on your couch watching it online. Sitting at home watching it online is like kissing a picture of your wife. It ain't the same. We serve a person through a place. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm a big old boy. If you're saved, listen, if you're saved, and you're not in a local church under the authority of a local pastor serving in some capacity, you are not right with God. I'm a member of First Baptist Church, Halton, Louisiana. My pastor preached here Monday night, giving spinning. I am under his authority. He's on my board. I go talk to him about things. I'm, I, listen, he, I, I used to preach to him when he was a kid, man. He's 40-something years old. I'm none of your business. Come on, amen. I could just about be his daddy, but he's my pastor. And I, I'm a member of that church. You know where my wife and I are when we're not on the road, which is very seldom we're at home. But you know where we are on Sunday morning? We're in Bible study and church. You know where we are on Wednesday night? Prayer meeting. You know what we do from Sunday to Sunday? We give a tithe. It goes right out of our bank account, right to the church's account. We can't even fudge. 10% right off the top. And one of the reasons, and I say this to the glory of God, one of the reasons God, I believe, has blessed our ministry and let us see, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of people come to Jesus is because for years we have put our ministry under the authority of a local church. God, listen, God always works through his church. That's why when a natural disaster happens, where are the Hindus? Where are the Muslims? Where's the LGBTQRXY, whoever they are? Where's the Jehovah's Witnesses? Where are the Mormons? Because they're not saved and they're not a part of a church. Is this making sense to anybody here tonight? Here's the third thing, and I'm just about finished. We serve a person through a place. But watch this. They came into the field of Joshua where there was a stone, but it was a great stone. We serve a person through a place, but we do it in power. The Bible says in Acts 1.8, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall receive power. Dunamis. Dunamis. That, that's where we got our word dynamite. If I took three sticks of dynamite and taped them together and lit the fuse and put them on that table right down there, you know what? He changed the scenery in this auditorium. Amen. And when the Holy Ghost of God explodes it, come on somebody, when the Holy Ghost of God explodes in you, it's going to change the scenery. It's power. Now, I, I, I tell you, I'm so weak of this. I, I'm so sick of this weak, anemic Little, you know, we're scared of everything. Boy, we're scared of people who don't look like us. We're scared of this. We're afraid. God's not giving us a spirit of fear, church, but a power and of love and a sound mind. Can I hear an amen? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What? It's the power of God. Come on, amen. To save those that believe. Here's the problem tonight. We can do church without the Holy Ghost. What is it about this church, your church, or your life you can't explain except God? Yeah. Somebody asked Brother Reuben, said, man, how, what happened this week? He said, I can't explain it. And I said, well, that's because God did it. Yeah. Right. Amen. Is anybody listening to me? Y'all can't explain what God does over in Uganda. God does that. Yeah. Right. Brother, you can't explain what God's done at your church all these years. God did that. You can't explain how your husband was out running around living like the devil and you prayed for him and God's, God did that. Power. Did anybody listen to me? That's why you don't need to give up on your kids, your grandkids. You don't need to give up on your neighbor. Come on, somebody help me. There's power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, we have lost our confidence in the gospel. 
listen, this, people say, well, I, I'm afraid, you know, I, I'm kind of an introvert. Oh, that's a bunch of baloney because I saw somebody back in your car at Walmart and you weren't an introvert then. Come on, amen. You know, I'm just afraid I'll say something wrong and I'm afraid, you know, they won't, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. Let me tell you something, I'm going to help you tonight. The power is not in your winsome personality or in your slick presentation. The power is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe it was Adrian Rogers that said, you, you, don't, you, you, don't have to, you don't have to defend a lion, just turn, turn him loose. He'll take care of himself, amen. And then we're, we're, we're afraid to die. You know, we spend more time praying folks out of heaven than we do praying folks out of hell. Sick people, well, we got, and don't misunderstand me. If I get sick, I don't want out praying for me. Well, we got a long, we got a list of sick people that long we're praying for to get well. We got a, we got a list of lost people about like that. Now, I'm not wanting to go on the next load. Don't misunderstand me. I believe God's got some years ahead of me, and I've got gas in the tank by the power of the Spirit of God. But I want to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. We're so afraid to die, we're not even living. I went to Pakistan a few years ago. Everybody thought I was insane. I was feeling pretty good about it, and I knew God wanted me to go, and I went to preach at Truel McConnell University over in Cleveland, Georgia, and their president's a former Muslim. And after you preach in chapel, you go to the president's house to have a nice meal. Students wait on everybody. He has some of the faculty and local church pastors come, and at the end of your meal, uh, they ask to have a Q&A with you to ask you about your ministry. So they were asking me some questions, and, and Dr. Kaner, Dr. Kaner said, uh, uh, Bill, where, where's your next uh, trip so we could pray for you? And I said, well, I'm going to Pakistan in a couple of weeks. And this former Muslim looks at me and says, are you crazy? What are they going to do, send me to heaven? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, our God is able to deliver, but even if he doesn't, we're not bound down to you stinking idol. Throw us in the furnace. I was reading today, this morning, my devotional time, when, uh, when Paul got stoned at I uh, Iconium, and then he got up the next day and walked 60 miles and preached in Derby. That's a dude right there. And then the Bible says he went back to Iconium. When I was at Louisiana College, I've told Brother Reuben this uh, because he pastored up in Spearsville. When I was at Louisiana College, there was some hangout. Young people hung out up there at Spearsville, and I was doing a weekend revival. And I went down to that, that deal. We weren't supposed to have alcohol, but they brought alcohol. And I was out there preaching, and a pickup truck came by. And in the back of that pickup truck was a bunch of guys with football helmets on. And they threw real, I'm talking, I'm talking about plastic bottles. I'm talking about glass Coke bottles at me, trying to get me to quit preaching. And they were all students at Louisiana College. This fired me up. Is anybody getting anything out of what I'm saying? It's power. Hey, let, let me help you tonight. We're living in the last days. We're victims of prophecy. Somebody's got to live in this wicked day. I don't know more, a more exciting time than to live right now. I believe we're the rapture generation. I believe most of us in this room are going to be in the rapture when Jesus comes. And you know what? We, we've gone through pandemics. Man, our government is, is messed up now, I, I guess, as it's ever been in my lifetime. I mean, we don't know if it's a boy or a girl. We're calling them purple penguins and pink penguins and... And, and now we got men going to women's bathrooms and women going to men's bathrooms and, and, and everybody's offended about everything. But let me tell you something. You can look at all that you want to. I turned over here back in the book in Revelation, and guess what? We won! Amen. Hey, I don't know who's playing football tonight, but what if they went out there knowing they were going to win 50 to nothing? I'm telling you, they would have a time. Yeah, sometimes we cry, sometimes our heart gets broken, sometimes we get disappointed, sometimes we feel like quitting. But I want to encourage you, saying to God, we already have won. Yeah, yeah. Right. Already won. Now, it's no secret. I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. Brother Rubens is a Saints fan. He and Jerry Chaddock give me a lot of grief. I was in Romania 
back uh, in the January before the February that the Saints won the Super Bowl, and the pastor took Wendy and I up to this place called Hell's Creek, and it was frozen over. And I told Wendy, Saints are going to win the Super Bowl next month. And I tell you, Dallas Cowboys, we had, matter of fact, I was just joking around. I put on uh, Facebook or Twitter here a few years ago. I said, can somebody tell me what channel the Cowboys are playing in a playoff game this Sunday? And a buddy of mine in South Louisiana sent me a message, try the history channel. <laughs> See how I get treated, brother Al? I mean, he got so bad, a friend of mine had two season tickets sitting on the dash of his pickup. And somebody broke in and left two more. I mean, boy, it, 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 it's... It, We're doing a little better now. Uh, but way back, way back, when our kids were little, Wendy was at home with our boys. I don't know if, if anybody here is old enough to remember this. We had a VCR. A friend of mine's wife wanted a, a microwave oven for a Christmas one, one Christmas, and he bought her a VCR. He came in January, one cold January day after working real hard. He was all tired and everything. And, and uh, he said, what's for supper? She said, it's on the stove. Put it in the VCR and warm it up. Amen. But, <laughs> but Wendy used to record the Cowboys games for him. Because I, I, I never got to watch him hardly. And uh, so I'd come in and I'd, I'd kiss Wendy, hug the boys and I'd get in my recliner, get me a big old bowl of bluebell, amen, and, uh, and uh, man, at halftime, it's, it's 10 to nothing. We, they kick off to us, we fumble, they kick a field, it's 13 to nothing. And I'm getting all nervous. Then all of a sudden, I think, dude, this is on tape. I just, zzz. we came back one, 17 to 13. I'd run it back. Didn't matter who fumbled. Didn't matter who threw an interception. Didn't matter who was all sides. I knew the score. Yeah, right. Hey, listen, we can walk out of here today. We can spit in the devil's eye and say, you know what? Ain't much about me, but I'm telling you, I serve a Lord who's Lord of glory. He's Lord of earth. He's Lord of hell. I'm telling you, he's conquered every foe. He's defeated the devil. Come on, somebody help me. I'm telling you, he came out of the grave. And I know I may not see it, I may not feel it, I may not even be able to touch it, but I know it's so. And I'm hanging on to Jesus until he comes. Let's pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, nobody's looking around. Brother Todd, as you come, just begin to play. I want to just ask you a few questions from the back row to the front. And I know this is a Friday night, most of us in here are believers. Now, I never assume that everybody is. Uh, listen, we were talking before the service, Brother Reuben, I was talking about church members we thought were surely saved that, that weren't. So I want to ask you a few questions tonight. How many of you in this room tonight, that you can lie to me, you can lie to the pastor, you can't lie to God. How many of you in this room tonight say, Bill, I'm saved, man. I, I'm not saved because I walked the aisle. I'm not saved because I prayed a prayer. I'm not saved because I got baptized. I'm not saved because I tried to live a good life. I'm saved because I realized I was a sinner. I repented. Jesus Christ came into my life. He gave me a new nature. He changed my life. I know I'm saved tonight. Can I see your hand up all over this house? 